His word will not be void. His truth will be my light. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? What power but his can counter the weight of sin's hold? I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace.
So I lift up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I lift up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. forever and his faithfulness to all generations amen let's get ready to praise church
and our soul sings for the greatness of His love. Sings my soul. Sings my
that again. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day. Thank you for um, joining us today, uniting us as your church to worship you and to praise your name. I just pray that we will uh, really glorify you with one heart, with one voice, in one spirit to truly use our gifts and um, use our faith in you to love one another and to bear each other's burdens, to not neglect each other's needs, but to really rejoice with one another. Um, I just pray that we may really look to the cross and fix our eyes on Jesus only. May our worship to you not only be on Sundays, but every day of our lives, that we may continue to remind ourselves of the price you paid for us, um, that our sins have been forgiven through your blood. Um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now we'll go into a time of offering. Thank you.
Um, and Kev will come up <laughs> and talk about the West Ride office cleanup. <laughs> Thank you, Minnie. All right, guys. Uh, just an important uh, announcement for the West Ride office. So, on the so on the 16th of March, we're gonna have an official cleanup of the office, and I want everybody to come up during the um, the prayer night. That most uh, the one is coming up, and I want you guys to come. They will be posted, um, and there will be identification of certain items that you may not take. But without those um, identifications on. Uh, those books, mostly couches, couple chairs. If you guys want to take them, it's really up to you guys. It's freebies, and you guys can I have a look. I'm like, hey, I like those items. You, first one um, picks up, they can be the one to take it. Uh, other than the things that we're not allowed to touch and take, um, those things will be left behind, right? Then what we're going to do is on the 16th of March, we need as many hands as possible to come, and we're going to take those, put them in the van, and we're going to go to Guinness House first, and then we're going to bring it to the church here. So we need a lot of hand and volunteers. So if you want to help out for the 16th of March, please let your shepherds know, and the shepherd will contact you now and put your name down on the detail. Is that good? All right, thank you, guys. Okay, no more people. <laughs> um, on the first week of April, we have our 10th anniversary. Um, Subin? Dan, note it down on your calendar. <laughs> um, we'll be having lunch after church here. And what was the other thing? Oh, Heartbeat Bulletin is out. March edition. Check your emails. <laughs> G'day guys, uh, can I just send all the kids away to the... Um, exists without the prayer, without the people who are genuinely connected to God. And we're going to spend the, this good seven days uh, fasting and praying, bring your family. We're going to meet every night. Uh, I don't know how the other campus will do, but please make sure that you all at least zoom in, right? Just spend that week um, preparing your heart, and especially that's the week of Easter. Um, so, so I'm going to come back to this again, and it is going to, it's going to almost define your 2024 in how you offer this time, yeah? Think about how you're going to fast and how, what do you, what do you expect from God in your prayer? All right. Um, Today's sermon is a kind of a, com uh, a continuation from the last week's sermon. It's about gospel. And it's not just about gospel, but we are moving into how this gospel be applied into our life. What does it look like when we live out the gospel? And the gospel in freedom, and freedom should come in together. And I'm gonna, we're going to actually explore into this. But before we do, do, do that, Last week, I, I, I shortly visited on the last part of Romans chapter 8. And I feel, I feel that I need to, it is important for me to point out that we have this crisis. We have, church have a crisis in the whole global Christianity actually going down. Um, I'm, I'm, I know, generalizing, I know there are churches like in Africa, Indonesia, and in Muslim countries, they're growing, I know that, right? But in the Western society that we're here now, the denomination I joined in, that we're all talking about that we are in crisis, we are in crisis. And um, after COVID came, then a lot of people uh, still haven't come back to church. And this is a reality. So that actually brought me into the, the place where I had to reflect on this. What did COVID did? And now we're about two or three years after COVID finished, when the whole world got hit by this uh, plague um, and gave us a reason not to turn up to church. The one good thing came out of it is that 
it clarified for many of us what we are really believing in. What we are truly trying to do together as a church. What are we called to be in this world? See, that got clarified when we are forbidden. We are prohibited to meet together. Because many of us don't know how to do Christianity without that kind of gathering. I'm going to come back to this, but you know, it just pops in my head anyway. So one of the struggles I had was there was those people that used to be with our church, not just Harpy, but previous church that I ministered to. They said they were uh, all in, in the church and they've been serving. And they left the church for one reason or another, like they don't like the church, uh, the member, or pastor like me, or whatever that happened, they left. I'm talking about the people who are serving and leading the worship or participating in mission trips and those kind of people, right? And they left the church, and now I'm hearing the news of them. Now they're denying God. They, they don't really even come. It's not about coming to church anymore. And they, people are asking, why, are not, why aren't you coming to church? It's like, oh, because I got disappointed by this person, this person, because of Pastor Joshua. And I hear that too, right? I give you all the uh, credit for, I mean, the, okay, there's a reason for that. Yeah? I, I, I can see that where they're coming from. But my deepest question is this. If someone disappointed you, if I disappointed, Pastor disappointed you, is that the reason that you abandon, you can abandon God. Or maybe you never had God in you at first place. Think about this. Because the passage we read the last few weeks in Romans chapter 8, the way it describes what we believed, it's just so grand, it's so amazing, so glorious, and you ditch this, you abandon this because of the disappointment that you had in the past, because of things that happened in your life, compared to anything happened in your life. Go back to read Romans chapter 8. You cannot walk away from this because of some pastor, because of some person in the church, some issue you have. You see, maybe you never got this from the first place. You never really understood Romans chapter 8 because... Those people here, the first listener in 2,000 years ago, these are the people who went to the, through the prison, imprisonment. They went to the lions of Dan. They got persecution. They went through all that because of this. They somehow see the value of the gospel that preached in Romans chapter 8. And he stays the oh, wow, my life is nothing compared to this. I can invest everything that I have for this if I can gain this. See, I want to encourage you to revisit this place for this season. This is why I'm probably repeating again, 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 because I realize if I don't make you guys understand that Christianity is not about uh, some pastor or good teaching or some like Sunday services or nice buildings and all those things we do without this, I think we fail at everything. We can be successful at so many things without getting this. Actually, you lost everything. All right. So that is the crisis I really believe. What is the crisis? I don't think the crisis is not the fact that people don't come to church. The crisis is the people who are in the church never got this at first place. And that something happens in their life. They, uh, like they got married, or they bought the, bought, bought, bought the house, or they have a kids, and life changes, and suddenly there's something that deep in your heart gets revealed, then the priority changes. Value changes. See, you are not changed because of the life circumstance. It only reveals what is already in you. So can I go back to this passage once again? Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Let's read this. 
No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, this is not the main passage. Actually, there are other passages I want to just uh, touch on today. But without you getting this, yeah, nothing really, really makes sense at the end of the day. All right, so verse 37 says, in all these things, you are more than conquerors. When, when you say no, it's what's trying to answer the question of what can separate us from the love of God, right? And it says, there's nothing, no. Those things, the, the sword or dangers or nakedness, those things cannot separate us. And he's just re-emphasizing that in all these things, in all the struggle we go through, we are more than conquerors. The word conquerors is, is actually a Greek word. Actually, uh, the origin of the Greek word, the, the, you know, the famous shoe company called Nike. It comes from that same word, right? And what he was using is a conqueror in those days. It's not just a little conqueror, like winning the basketball game. It's not just winning the, um, the soccer game. But conqueror in those times is a conquering donation. It's, a, it's a, someone who defeated the, the big, great enemy. So we are basically talking about the, the devil and the death. And you talk about, we're going to talk about the, all this. So we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay, the, the who loved us, this, the Greek word in the tense wise is that what happened in the past and has a continual effect in our life. So everything that, uh, when God says, I love you, that everything he says about love, uh, love of God stems from one event, action in the past, that Jesus what, died on the cross. And that is a demonstration. That is a proof. That is a basis of his love. He's saying, I love you. You don't believe, believe this. This is what happened, right? So through him who loved us and continued to love us because of that, you and I are more than conquerors. Okay, if you're still not convinced, the magnitude of the Paul is trying to convince, tell, telling us about uh, uh, what gospel-driven life, life looks like. It's verse 38, it says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, whether you die or live, right? Because in Christ, I told you this before, I've been through my own sickness, my own struggle, depression, and all that stuff. Sometimes living was hard. Dying was better, but death, some people, is such a traumatic experience. And we know some of you guys go through the, the, uh, the losing your family members and all. And I know that, right? Yeah, we just come from the Korea right now, so you get here. See, but we see death very differently now because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We see our life very differently now because of what Jesus has done on the cross, right? Because people were dying in those days because they believed in Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that's it, right? Because it was worthy for them. How about no angels, no rulers? They had a great fear of angel or spiritual fear, uh, spiritual figures in those days, right? And they have all this like a uh, uh, different religion and as well as this idea of uh, the Nazism or this, uh, the, uh, was it the heretic? understanding of gospel came into the church and it's saying they highlighted this angelic figure how high authority they are and all that and Jesus is one of them and all that stuff and Paul said no 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 all this spiritual being you fear of all this spiritual being you highlighted you worship they are nothing they are nothing compared to what Jesus has done for us right and for those presents are those to come here and now things to come Right? No powers, no height or death, anything else in all creation. So he concluded with anything else in all creation. So there's nothing in this list can be excluded in our life. From the small to the big. From the small to the big. And to understand the big thing, you have to understand how to apply 
the gospel in your small thing. That's my point. My point is that we have such a low view of gospel sometimes. Okay, for those people who believe in the gospel, a lot of people I've found that they see the gospel as a, like an insurance. Insurance only like you know that kicks in the effect after you die. Say, okay, I believe in Jesus, of course, but that only influenced me when I die. In this life, I'm on my own. Or in this life, God is God, is me, uh, I'm it. So, you know what? Also, some people say, okay, I tick the box. I'm, I know I'm going to heaven somehow. They have that theological illusion in their head. And then, but I'll just do whatever I want to do here. And I see the Bible. They, they go to Bible, uh, Bible study. They've read the Bible or they've been to Sunday school. So they know this kind of thing, right? So they have this gospel as a kind of insurance, just in case. This is right. So I tick the box. I got baptized. I've been to church. But let me live my life the way I want to do. Live my life. Or on the other hand, it's just like, okay, this is in the future. But in presence, I have to figure out by myself what God has done on the cross. Okay, that's good. But that is just something belongs to the future, right? It's nothing to do with me, what I'm going through right now in my Separation with my boyfriends or girlfriends. With my, you see, I don't take it lightly because a lot of you guys, all single people, I know how hard it is for you emotionally when you go through that kind of breakups and the separation. And let me ask you a question. Where is Jesus in that moment then, right? Oh, Jesus is too big. The gospel is just too big for me to just... Um, to, to imply, apply that into, into that situation. No, so let me figure this out. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. No, that's not how gospel-driven life works. I want to teach young kids when they lost the toy and the, they struggle and say, what does Jesus done for the person, that baby, in that moment, what does that look like? You know, this, we have such a low view by separating God's uh, the, the gospel from our current situation. Oh, we have such a carnal view. Making everything about us. Okay, Jesus died for me. Okay, so more, I'm more than conquerors. You love that kind of verses. And you will, will come to the in Philippians. Is, okay, everything is all work for good for those who are in Jesus Christ. So everything is going to be okay. All right, so God, give me the money. Give me the job. Give me the house. Give me this. Give me that. And when you don't get it, and you suddenly triggered. I, I um, saw one of the uh, testimony, not the testimony, the one of the YouTuber. Yeah, you don't know that. You know, I, I'm searching the YouTuber, I bump into this girl, um, the, the, kind of a comedian kind of girl, and saying there was interview was that do you have a religion? Said, no, and uh, I used to believe in. Uh, I used to go to church. Uh, I don't anymore. Why not? And her answer was because I prayed and I didn't get any answers. That was her reason not believing in God anymore. And I think that was the, one of the most honest answers that I got from a person. Just saying, look, you know what? If God is not real, I'm not going to believe in God. I'm not going to fake it. I like that. But the problem is this. Somehow in our back of our mind, you know, somehow we believe that if we believe in God, God owes to us to answer our prayer. We have this whole lot of entitlement spirituality. God owes me to give me what I want. See, gospel is a good news, but it's not the news that's going to spoil you. And that everything is about you, that view of the gospel is so carnal, so flesh, so self-centered. You know, then that, then this Romans chapter 8 does not really make sense. And oh, it makes sense to you, but you misunderstood. There's a huge misleading understanding in your heart of the gospel. How about legalist view? I just briefly touched on you know, last week how sometimes we come to the gospel and live out, uh, try to live out the gospel, but it's turning into legalism. Yeah? Like a lot of Christians living this 
guilt and shame whenever they do the things um, um, somewhat that come to make them comfortable and about like my wife buying Tesla, right? <laughs> things like that. Uh, where they come from? Because I struggle with that too. You know, where they come from? Because somehow we felt that what God wants from us is that because God has given us a great promise and we need to suffer here, we need to be miserable here, we need to be unhappy here, we glamorize it, we highlight it. And I, and I, I, believe, I believe there are people who are living their life according to God's plan, God's purpose, that they're living very, choosing the poverty on purpose for the mission, I think there's a huge respect, there's a huge admiration. I don't denounce that, I don't deny that, I don't make fun of, I'm not making fun of them. But what I'm saying is if you think that you are more spiritual than others because your life is miserable for Christ, right? You got it wrong. This is not what the Bible is speaking to you. You do not worship poverty. You do not worship suffering itself. I mean, this is a huge, uh, this, um, I'm, not, I'm not just saying on my own thought, thought here, it's a, uh, the heretic word, uh, the idea coming from outside in those days, uh, this Greek philosophy, you know, the Stoic philosophy, they come that how our body is evil and spirit is uh, and a good, so we have to punish our body by not eating, by not getting married, and all those things, self-inflicted punishment, and they sort of slipped in into Christianity. They, they, Apostle Paul, take us on it. How about religious Jewish idea of that you have to come up with, uh, observe all these rules and regulations to make God happy, right? Have a right relationship with God. See, this is the thing. When there was a young man came to Jesus, and his question was that, what must I do, right? What must I do to have eternal life? Luke chapter 18, right? look upon it right later, right? And his question was, what follow me. What Jesus was saying is that each, in answering in a different way, then the celebrity thing that you have, because he was rich, right, and follow me. What Jesus was saying is that you think you're so righteous, you think you're so good because you observe all this. The thing is that you never attempt, you never get tempted to steal anything because you've been rich. You've been always have this comfortable lifestyle because that's why you never hated probably anyone. You are afford to be able to like hide your deepest sin in your heart because of the, all the wealth and comfort and the support that you have. And you telling me that you're righteous and you have a right to have a right relationship with God. What must I do? And Jesus says, there's nothing you can do. Let me rebuild it. What is in your heart? Let me just 
taking apart all this facade, all this illusion, all this mask you've been wearing, thinking that you are good enough. See, Jesus said, you cannot do anything to earn this. This is too valuable. This is too good. See, Romans chapter 8, it's like no life, no death, no angels, no past, no presence. What can you give to God to earn this? See, that is the gospel. That's why world keep on asking, what should we do? What should we do? Like Buddhists asking, what should we do to this? They suggest answer a way of living, a way of the certain principle, come up with a teaching. But the Christianity don't give you teaching, it gives you news, good news. Saying it's not about what you do, it's already done. And let me just tell you what happened. Yeah? Jesus died on the cross because God loves you. It is settled, it is done, it is finished. And when you put your trust in Christ, this is what happens. Romans chapter 8 happens in your life. Legalism view. This is the deepest crisis of Christianity right now, I believe. That's why, guys, I love doing the church the way we do right now. Yeah? Like uh, you see this Melbourne campus, you don't see the camera, right? The small camera. Now the kids who have gone out the park, right? Um, have become even smaller now. See, now, when you take away the illusion of religion, there's no glamorism. There's no, nothing to be so fascinated by except Jesus. Except Jesus. Why are we doing this for the last seven years, right? This small community, small church, why are we doing this? I keep on asking you, do you want to stop doing this? It's, it's, I want to do this, I want to do this. You know, why are we doing this? Because, because we have this ample opportunity. If it's not the gospel, we don't have any reason to do the church together. If it's not the gospel, then we don't have to this suffer together like this anymore. See? We have this clear view of the gospel. Okay. Now, let me give you an example then. Example of a person who lived out this gospel. All right, okay. So, gospel came to us. And this is reality, chapter, Romans chapter 8 is a reality to us. It is reality. It is the promise, yeah? It is promise given to you and me. It should be applied in every situation in your life. What happened after this then? What happened? What do you do then? You need to leave it out. You have to live out the gospel. You don't go and ask, God, give me more so that I can be happier. No, no, no. You are already, ha you have already enough. God cannot love you more than what He already loved you in Christ. You cannot undo what God already had done on the, on the cross and make Him love you less. Does it make sense? Yeah? So then what do we do? Yes, of course, there's something that you and I have to do. We need to live out out the gospel and in a practical sense there are something that i want to highlight um when you live out the gospel then first thing actually i see is the freedom if i says freedom 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 of the gospel driven life i'm going to revisit this place but what kind of freedom i'm talking about well freedom not as in doing whatever you want to do but freedom based upon this gospel. And you see that freedom from the opinions of others. I know you probably heard that so many times from all these you know, pop psychology, self-help books, and all that's the opinions of others, right? And, but I think there's a value in it because we're living in an unprecedented uh, the world the generation. The opinions of others matter so much more than any, any, time, any other time. Right? Because actually, if you have actually great opinions of others, a lot of these good opinions of others, you can actually make a living out of it now. Right? YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, the more what, the subscriber you have, you can act, earn a lot of money. Actually, I found out how much money this guy makes. Wow, maybe I should quit my job and become a YouTuber or something like that. You know? My Instagram is close and I, you have to apply. And I actually, there are a lot of people that I don't accept. And, uh, and maybe I should make it open so people actually, I get rich, okay. No. 
Why opinions of others became a, such a powerful thing for us, especially this day and age? Because deep in our heart, all right, deep in our heart, God designed for us to seek for the significance. We all want to be, or we all want to know, yeah, we know. Now, we are not becoming, but we want to know we are already uh, important, valuable. Because that's how God created us. Everybody wants that. That's why I say, hey, it's not important. It's not just you are happy, but you want others to think that you are happy. That's more important, right? But what Apostle Paul did when the gospel comes into someone's life, it changes and frees a person from that that kind of bondage in a way, that desire to get the approval from others again, again, again. Okay, this Philippians chapter 1, 15 to 18. Let's hear this. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former declaim, uh, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my uh, imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Okay, let me give you a quick context. When Apostle Paul preached the gospel, pure gospel, and great signs and wonder happen, people start to believe in God and to follow Jesus. And what happens straight after that, there is a uh, Con uh, was it the comparison coming in? There are other apostles there. There are other teachers there that the Bible doesn't mention, right? There's, we don't know that how many people out there, right? They are preaching the gospel as well. Apparently, right? In this passage shows, but there are some people doing it out of ambition, out of or envy or rivalry, right? And they probably um, uh, they compare their ministry against the other. Uh, the uh, ministry that Apostle Paul did as well. And Apostle Paul probably heard it, right? And he had to defend again, again, again that, that, uh, that his apostleship, you know, he, I'm an apostle too. So he had to defend himself again, again, because the attack does not necessarily come from outside, but inside the church as well. You know, as a pastor, as well as a public figure, you know, whether I'm big or small, and I deal with certain public you know, opinions too. And when Paul had that, how did he overcome this? When you're constantly being judged, constantly evaluated, constantly being on the, uh, like someone's, on the, someone's my, my mind and, and their word, and their mouth. And uh, it, doesn't it torment you? Some of you guys go home and it's like what this person would be thinking about you and uh, saying about you. It becomes uh, such a, a shackle in your mind. Right? A lot of people, I see a lot of people be so insecure because of this as well. And that's why you don't want to, you don't want to um, the, uh, show anything, any weakness, uh, anything that doesn't really desirable to others. And uh, it, for me, I put anything on the Instagram. I learned that I shouldn't do that because, um, you know, I should get a permission from girls and I can I put this. <laughs> I'm doing that now. I'm doing that now. <laughs> because I, I don't care about opinion of others. Oh, no, just kidding different matter by the way but do you struggle with that but when the gospel comes to Paul he says that hey these people have all this opinion over me it doesn't affect me it doesn't change me why because I know one opinion that defined me and it is done he loves me he said, there's nothing that separate me from his love. He made up his mind about me. How do I know? Because there's proof that the cross is there. So no matter what you say, I know I am love. I know I am secure. I know I am significant in him. And this guy who loves me is greater than anybody you can think of. So why do I care about your opinion about me? See that? And Apostle Paul said, because of that high, high view of the gospel, and I'm going to die for that. I'm going to preach this gospel. This, as long as this is preached, and nothing else matters. 
So, okay, you doing it out of uh, to make uh, me uh, uh, torment me to un make me unhappy. That's fine. Go for it. I don't care what you think about me as long as you preach the gospel. You know, this is such a freedom in there. I can um, agree enough. I can't agree enough with Apostle Paul when he said this because I went through my own journey as a pastor, right? And I, I can't say that I'm completely free because we all have our own moments, right? But I'm so glad Apostle Paul put that thing. When gospel is preached to me, what is more important? My health is not as important as gospel. It is important, but not as much as important. My church, happy church, how successful it is, it doesn't matter how important it is. But my problem is that when people like you and me don't understand this and continue to do the church, people getting baptized without knowing this, People actually living out the entire Christian walk and without knowing this, uh, this Jesus who died on the cross and the effect of our life, our marriage, and you did the Christianity and doing the ministry and the pastors and so obsessed with making church to grow and they always make sure that everybody comes to church. There's all their priority. They put their energy, their heart, their talents, everything in it. Without gospel, how terrible your life will be as a Christian. I'm just saying it. It is one of the most miserable way of living Christian life without your life run by, running by the gospel. It's a news. It's done. Apostle Paul saying, hey, it doesn't matter. I rejoice. I have a reason to rejoice. You are for me? Great. You are against me? Great too. As long as you preach the gospel, it sets you free from all that. But don't twist this into something carnal and flesh and self-centered view. Because next verse talks about that. Next verse that I want to introduce is about, then what about circumstances? It's not about people. What about the things happening around my life? Circumstances. Circumstances can be the, the things that actually drag you down. Yeah? Yeah. We all go through things in our life. And what does the gospel do when we have that kind of a difficult circumstances? Well, Philippians chapter 4 it says this, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know what, how to be brought low, how to be abound. You know, in any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. See, you love the verse 13, right? I can do all things. Through whom you love the verse of said, I'm more than conqueror. But you're fully out of context if you don't understand the gospel. What he was saying is not about, yeah, I can do all things. No, 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 it's not about it. It's I can, you can be in any circumstances because of the gospel, because of what Jesus has done for you. He's saying, the, right before this, the, the Philippine church wants to support him. He said, thank you, great. But you know, I'm not asking for money because you know I I know how to be in rich. I can I know how to be in abundance. I know how to be in poverty. Poverty doesn't matter. Prosperity doesn't matter for me. Why? Because of Christ Jesus, what He has done for me on the cross. So I told you, right? Poverty will never make sense if you are not in Christ. Prosperity does not make sense if you are not in Christ. I think. We are living in society, in Australian society right now. We don't have persecution like uh, these people have. You know, now we don't have extreme, you think, oh, I'm so poor because I don't drive Tesla. No, you think again, man. You know, if you, if you have a house or, or the roof over your head, um, that, that means you are richer than 99% of the population of the world. You know, you got to get the grip of the reality here, how richly, abundantly we are blessed here, right? What I'm saying is that if you do not know how to praise God in your poverty, you will never be able to praise God in your prosperity. And if you do not know how to pursue God in your prosperity, you never know how to pursue God in your poverty. Poverty and prosperity is irrelevant in your life when gospel comes and becomes the center of your life. It drives you, it actually forms you, defines you, and makes sense out of your, this very weird life that we all have here. And the Paul is saying this, yep, I can do all things. 
You put me into the Wall Street in New, New York and I can preach the gospel to these people because I know good news, better news than this share market. You put me in the street in the, the Harlem or Africa somewhere that they got nothing in and I can preach to this, uh, the native people because I know what Jesus has done for them as well. Gospel defines me. You put me into depression. Oh yeah, I can go through that depression. You put me into the, the highlight, the highest of my success in my career. You know, I can still rejoice in Christ. You poor uh, poverty or prosperity will not touch me. You not bend me. You will not deter me because I understand this passage. I completely understand the passage because the gospel drives me. See, one of the things I'm learning more and more is that I realize pastor can't fix all the problem. I think that actually the problem was the pastor trying to fix all the problem was the actual problem. And our people are saying, oh, they come and ask my help and, and, and I do the counseling and all those things. Actually, I continue to do that. Don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand. I will continue. I love doing that, spending time with you. But I see a lot of people have this pseudo relationship with God. Right? without encountering this, what Jesus has done for them life, for their life. So when that pastoral figure or that people, any figures around you that enabled you or empowered you, gone, you don't know what to do. Because suddenly there's no one that you can actually put your trust in anymore. See, there's such a messed upness in there. There's a crisis in there because the gospel is preached already. It's done to you. You need to have a relationship with God through Jesus. No one else in between. That's what we do in the house church. That's what we're trying to make you, tell you. Get rid of that illusion of the religion. Get rid of all the facade and the just know this gospel and face to face this God who loved you. And there's nothing can separate you from the love of God. Any circumstance, any opinions of others. Experience that freedom that you have. Oh, it took me a long time to come to this place. You know, you ask me, Pastor, how are you doing? And I'm still sick, you know. How are you doing? And, uh, I'm okay. But if you ask me, are you happy? And say, yes, I am happy. <laughs> I'm happiest than ever. I'm dealing with all these things as well. I'm still happy. Can I ask you a question? What drives your life? What is driving your life from this to the smallest congregation to the largest congregation and whoever watching this video? What drives your life? If it's not gospel, it must be something else. Oh, nothing drives me. I drive my life. No, actually, no, 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 no. Either your desire, your circumstances, your 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 whatever that you love about that is driving you. Yeah. You bring all that and compare with its gospel and print the scale one side and to another. And Bible says that you put all this thing in this world, all the riches, all the highs and lows, everything you put one scale, all universe, all heaven and earth, everything you put in and put Jesus on the other and Jesus will outweigh everything. Do you get this? If you don't get it, then what are you excited about at church? What are you singing for at church? Because you bought that Tesla, you bought that house? No, you have no idea what you actually already have, the value and significance. And let Jesus, let the gospel drive your life and live that out joyfully, thankfully, with a satisfaction and significance in your heart. Let me come back to this. In the specific situation for the next few weeks, how we can apply gospel to room life. How about we pray now then? Let's pray. Let's spend some time in prayer. I'm going to ask that to come up here. Are you going to, going to do the jimbe again? No? Okay. Everybody close your eyes. I don't know what kind of song the is going to sing. <laughs> but spend some time in prayer. What is driving your life? What is driving your life?
surrender. Sing that again. I surrender. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Thank you for the message this day that you have prepared for us. Um, thank you for making us conquerors, Lord, through your love. Although we didn't deserve it, um, you credited the victory, Lord, on the cross onto us. So I pray that we may, we may not fall into temptation to believe that we are good without you. Um, I lift up, Lord, um, the week that is to come um, in all, it, all of its highs and lows, Lord. May we be conquerors, conquerors marked by Jesus. And this, in this way, we shall be witnesses, Lord, of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let us end this service uh, with a benediction. One, two, three. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>